All right, let's get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar about reinforcement learning and finance. From playing games to algorithmic trading, yeah, we have left the world of games. This was just, uh, yeah, for us, a stepping stone. Uh, we have entered the world of finance, uh, primarily with regard to our finance environment, to which we applied a DQL agent um, yeah, that was able to solve the problem of card pool. Uh, one of the yeah, more simpler games in the open AI gym environment. Um, and what we're going to do today is getting a little bit more realistic, right? So in terms of uh, the finance environment, as well as the financial agent, the FQL agent, as I usually call it, um, for financial Q learning. Of course, we will keep the, the deep notion there as well. And uh, as you know, we have uh, the resources um, all here on the slide deck, uh, the GitHub repo. This was updated with the two notebooks that I plan to use for today. You know, you can use Google Colab. Uh, the code shall be executable with Google Colab. So I noticed that with the free tire of uh, Google Colab, this is all pretty, pretty slow. So on my uh, Mac M1 uh, machine, it's much, much faster. Uh, of course, you can download or clone the repo or whatever and do it. The uh, chat as usual, your questions, please post them in the uh, chat channel on the Discord server so that we have a bit of documentation there. And of course, if you like, follow on Twitter for future announcements. I don't want to go through the slide deck. Uh, I will build on top of what we have been doing before. So uh, many of the things uh, have been covered. We just go a few steps deeper. Uh, for example, we had a question in the previous uh, webinar, can we use other features, for example, uh, instead of just prices? plus uh, return or end or return, right? Yes, of course we can do. And this is among others, one of the things that we are going to cover today and the review will be done based on the code. So um, again, here, the GitHub repo, there you have um, all, the, um, all the latest um, things there, right? So like, like the two new, here you see the two new notebooks that I've added for today's session. And in Colab, of course, when you uh, yeah, use Colab, you can execute it directly without any need to download or installation. I will do it locally. I mentioned it before. It's already um, yeah, the advantage that it will run quite a bit faster. So I open the uh, first one and I call this uh, Fin2. So in the sense of we started with Fin1. Pretty simple, same DQL agent now, um, a little bit uh, improved. The regular imports, nothing special here, and the imports for TensorFlow, right? I said the lock level, um, relatively high, so that we only get real errors and not like one of the uh, many, many uh, warnings and messages that uh, TensorFlow is usually uh, sending out, right? And here we have. Uh, yeah, the standard other import stands and dropout. And uh, recently I checked and I didn't use dropout, but here uh, it will be part of the uh, DQL agent. Uh, I disable eager execution for faster training here in this context. And yeah, we are good to go. We are set for um, our improved finance environment, right? So this is um, what. Um, um, what the plan. So, you know, every once in a while I look left with regard to questions or what we might have there. So that's uh, that's the basic idea. Um, that I can follow along and then can answer here in the webinar if there are questions. So improved finance environment. You know, we have two um, uh, mock-up classes, if you like. This is in order to be consistent still with the OpenAI gym environment. Right, here you see class observation space, class action space. Pretty simple uh, classes just to mimic the API of, um, of the OpenAI gym environments. Um, but we don't do that much more with it. Now we come, let me execute this so that later on I have this. And maybe I also zoom in a bit so that we can focus a bit better on the single lines of code here. So. Um, the data set is the same that I've been using before. So that's the data set, uh, 12 symbols and uh, time series end of day for some 10 years. 
Um, here, see already, I have a few more parameters that I can uh, pass in here, right? Uh, symbol, features, window, lags, leverage, uh, minimum performance, uh, start, end, mu um, here. Um, uh, I come to that, and now it's, it's a little bit out of the blue, but uh, there you can pass parameters in order to normalize, for example, for a validation or test environment, to normalize the data set with the same statistics that you have been using for the training environment, which is actually what we should do. So what we have uh, done with the more simple one is simply saying, well, um, we um, have one data set and the data set is used. We don't really do any validation nor do we do any proper testing, right? It was just like a proof of concept, if you like, to transfer the DQL agent learning uh, from Cardpool one to one to finance. Now we are getting a little bit more realistic. And again, a few of the things are targeted towards being able to separate, for example, the data set and to have, uh, let's say, a training data set and a validation data set that we check uh, continuously during the training, right, during a single training uh, epoch, uh, how the agent is performing. But more on that when we come to that point. So symbol features. For features, we have now a creator selection. i show you them uh, later down there. So before, we just had one feature. So we had a selection between price or, um, or end um, uh, return. Now we can use multiple features um, and feel free to add here to the feature list. Uh, you see it already down there. The window is for the uh, rolling statistics down here, right? So rolling self window, this is for the momentum uh, feature or the volatility feature or also for the uh, simple moving average. Yeah, very simple statistics, very simple filters that I use there. So I, I won't work here with leverage, this is more when you, for example, do leverage trading with FX or uh, CFDs, for example, and you want to see how this um, works in a leverage way. The minimum performance now is a threshold value um, where we later on calculate um, the uh, performance overall, really in terms of like the uh, returns that uh, the agent earns by trading in the market. Recall before we just had a plus one or a zero in terms of reward. Now we take care of the performance as well and we say, well, when the performance is uh, worse than, I don't know, here, here you see minimum performance, by default, worse than 15%, then stop, right? So in a sense of a stop loss, and here is a stop trading, right? Um, it's not realized losses yet. And then we have start and uh, mu and standard deviation. This is related to the data set, right? We can pick out here different slices from an existing data set. Right, observation space, and the rest is as before. Also, the data that we get, of course, if you have another data set that is as simple as the one that we have here, uh, this can be replaced there as well. And the data preparation now has grown. Right? When I talk about multiple features that you can now choose from, um, you have, um, as before, you will have the symbol itself plus the log return. Um, we will drop an A here, and um, there is a simple moving average, there is a momentum feature, and here we have a volatility feature. So, uh, very simple calculation. So, for the momentum, let's say I take the, the log returns uh, rolling window of X days uh, here in this context, the mean for the volatility, same procedure, rolling window 10 days by default, and take the standard deviation. This can all be adjusted, or you can add here. Uh, I don't know, more features as you like, right? Should be easy enough. So here now is the point where uh, it is checked whether mu is passed. Um, and if mu is there, we would assume that there is also a standard deviation value that we should use. Um, but if this is not the case, right, if mu is none, then we calculate here mean and standard deviation and do with the just calculated values denormalization. Otherwise, we use the values that have been passed. Again, that's the idea here that we have maybe such statistics from the training environment, training data, uh, training environment data, but that way around, and use these statistics for validation and uh, or for testing. And down here is the, uh, well, the direction, which is for us. Uh, uh, the important um, 
um, the important uh, part in a sense of um, that we uh, deal here with the uh, directional um, data, right? But I take this not from the normalized data, right? Otherwise, we would run into trouble. I take so normalized here is the underscore. I take here for the normalized data, I take nevertheless here as the base the unnormalized data, the regular data, so that we get the direction correct, right? So here's uh, another uh, check. If we don't have an end value, right, um, we go um, until the very end. Otherwise, uh, we can keep it flexible and provide an end. Data. You will see it in action. Uh, for the first uh, application already, right? And the rest now is almost the same, but as I said before, we have now the performance here, right? The performance, which will be the major characteristic that we use uh, to judge you know, success. Not only I got it right, got it right, got it right, but what is the performance of the agent in terms of cross-performance compounded? And uh, yeah, this looks as before. Down here in the step um, method, we have now a little bit of a different reward design. Um, we have, as before, a plus one if the prediction or the trade is correct. Um, uh, here one, and if it's uh, false, uh, zero. Right? We could also go here, depends on, right? You want to design it, you can play around with it. Could also go with a minus one here in this uh, in this context, but we have another um, reward that's now the one that is related to the return itself. So, if the prediction, if the trade is correct, then I get the absolute return, right? If, if I go long and I have a positive return, fine. If I go short and therefore the market makes a negative return, I get the absolute. So I benefit from my short position. Otherwise, if I'm wrong, I would get the negative absolute value. So in the total reward here, this is like our counter that we had before. We just take reward one, right? The rest, as I say, is the same, but we have now, instead of the accuracy, I don't really do anything here with the accuracy. I could also have like another condition um, based on the accuracy here. I go primarily with the uh, minimum performance, which I think is a little bit more uh, sensible, sensible here. And here you see as a reward, I get back reward one plus reward two times 252. So here I have now chosen a pretty large multiplier, something like uh, yeah, an annual return um, so that it has some meaning um, in relation to reward one. Otherwise, if I would take this out here, Right, this multiplier we would have pretty small, tiny returns only, right? Like uh, minus 0 0.0003 or something like that, um, or plus uh, 0 0.001. Uh, pretty small when compared here to uh, reward one. Therefore, I scale this up rather arbitrarily. And originally in the AI and finance book, where this code not exactly that way, but uh, where you find a version of what I'm showing here. Um, is used. I have had just a, a small factor when I recently discussed this with somebody. Um, I really noticed that the idea was correct, but my scaling was not large enough in order to make a reward to um, meaningful enough compared to the other one. Yeah, that's the improved environment. So more features and uh, performance now calculated. So we are now more in the financial world, right? It's not like uh, Correct, correct, false, false, correct, correct, right? It's more like, oh, what was the performance? What is my cross performance over time? And uh, yeah, here we see the instantiation on the environment, it's essentially with the symbol. And now I chose here three features of those that I have, right? Again, it's not listed, but I have here uh, the price itself, R, S, M, V. So a maximum of five features is what I what I can show here, right? And uh, the other ones here is window and lags, right? So this is what it shows, window, so that we see it maybe a little bit better, and lags, so lag data. Before, in the simple finance environment, we had one feature and could just uh, play around with the lags, so for um, 
congruence, we, we chose four lags. Now I go with a window of 10 for the, for the uh, statistics, for the filters that I calculate, and five lags in this uh, context. So how does it look when we uh, get started? Like before, I have the option to draw randomly here some actions, right? When I get started, environment reset, and you see now the structure. Um, three features, right here is the price feature, here is the returns feature, here is the volatility feature. Um, price here, on a higher level, right, we see all normalized values, this has been normalized now. Um, here we see the returns and for the volatility, like uh, the numbers in the third column. When we step forward here with the random action, we get another state, which is now a matrix, right? And we get um, here the um, the reward. Uh, sorry, it's R R for reward. Sorry, that was uh, here the reward done and info. So you see the reward here. This was obviously a good random uh, action or prediction in this context. Uh, we get a higher um, reward higher than one, I wanted to say. Here it's two, right, 1.99. Right, now it's a negative reward, as you can see. And the negative reward is something that we didn't have before. So before it was just like uh, plus one, plus one, plus one, and when we are done, well done, uh, we were done, right? There was nothing like a large positive reward or a larger negative reward. So this is now a bit more sophisticated, and that's here the origin of it, right? Our two calculations above, and there you see uh, the mechanism. Of course, you can play around here with maybe 100 is, um, let's say, the better one, right? Then it has less um, less impact on the reward. Maybe I go with 100, right? now that I've talked about it. Um, so this is what you also see often uh, written down or reported by others that the reward design is a important and often um, yeah, more an art than science. Uh, here in this context, I wouldn't know exactly where to look up right, the, the proper factor or the reward design in this context. You have multiple options and what I'm showing here is just one option to, to have here a financial reward based on the return included. Right. Uh, there's a question with regard to um, the window dependent on some external objective like the size that minimizes the shortfall. Exactly as the question is posed, uh, the window based on some external factor. The window here, again, is more like a simple thing, right? I go with a 10 uh, a 10 day window, days because the day the data is end of day. This could also be one minute bars if we have minute bar data. Um, so this is more like arbitrary, but to condition this on something like a hyper parameter optimization where you go and optimize the window, this can be done, right? But uh, not straight out of, the, out of the box here without adding um, there are some procedure in order to do so. So here it's simply, I say 10, and as simple as that, it takes 10 and then get started calculating the uh, statistics there, right? Yeah, so I go with the hundreds, let's see what, what the numbers uh, say afterwards. And uh, with regard to the numbers, now an improved financial Q learning agent, right? What I said before, instead of DQL, I usually abbreviate this as FQL. Um, from collections, I import DQ. I've mentioned this from the beginning. This is like a limited uh, list object, limited in the sense of uh, maximum of uh, 2,000 elements. And what are now the inputs for the FQL agent? So the FQL agent um, here can be parameterized by providing the hidden units. I have a kind of fixed setup for the model. Right, there is one hidden layer, another one, right? And here we have the output layer. So it's not by far not a huge or deep, deep neural network. 
uh, but a hidden units is one factor that I allow for. Then the learning rate, the learning environment, and the, and the validation environment. Plus, I can turn on and off the dropout feature of the model. So two environments, one flag, and the rest, as they say, is more or less the same. Right? So um, epsilon, epsilon minimum, epsilon decay, learn rate gamma. Uh, batch size, I think I increased this here a bit, right? Total reward averages, and now three additions here, the single performances, the average performances, and the validation performances that are collected in list objects. So now that the finance environment uh, provides us with performance information, uh, here the, the FQL agent should uh, work with uh, them as well. Yeah, the model is built with a final call here. And we have a sequential model. Here, the first layer, the input layer. Then dropout, yes or no. We can work with the dropout or not. So to avoid overfitting, for example. Um, a second layer, we can work with the dropout, yes or not, depending on the flag. And here, the output layer, two actions still, um, and uh, linear activation. So you see here also for the input shape, this allows us now to um, pass in here a two-dimensional object, right? And the final step here is a compilation of the model. So I work here with uh, uh, RMS prop. Maybe you can also check Adam. Maybe that's that's a bit better. So act, replay, learn. I think there's nothing different to what we had before. Um, here it's straightforward, uh, the replay with the learning, the single learning steps, that's uh, as we had it before. Um, so from an outside point of view, the, the code remains the same, but what's going on in there, right, with regard to the, the modeling, the training, and the data, and the states, and the features, um, this uh, vanishes a bit behind the scenes. Um, but there is here now the addition of the... Um, performances that we append, here the, um, the average performances that are calculated on the fly as the average over the last 25, right? And the validation performances, they are collected down here, All right? Here, self-validation performance. Okay, the rest here is formally the same. I have another notebook where I've implemented the same based on the MLP um, regressor of scikit-learn. Uh, there, there are a few more changes, but most of the changes that are, again, different from what we see here are given by uh, requirements in terms of data that we pass uh, to the object. There's a little bit more on that in a few minutes. There you see this is, to some extent, now a better agent, but we don't see that much in terms of better. Better now means that, uh, primarily means that the agent is able to work with multiple features uh, that are, each of them are lacked in this context, right? So before we might have only four data points describing the um, environment. Now we might have, I don't know, five features times six lags, so 30 features um, as compared to the four that we had before. So a more granular way, a more detailed way of describing the, um, the environment, the state of the environment. Yeah, and for the validation, of course, uh, we have the validation environment, while maybe I should have emphasized that, that particular thing, right? Here, the state for the learning comes from the learning environment, right? And for the validation, it comes uh, from the validation environment. Right. So there's also now a major difference. Before we had some testing, right, where we said we train on the data set and then we test on the same data set. Here we really now have uh, a differentiation in, um, in terms of maybe the first uh, three quarters are used for training and the final uh, quarter is used for uh, validation, for example. In that sense here, it's validation because it's done um, during the whole exercise, but it's also some um, testing. I could also do this once at the very end, if you like, but I do it permanently, therefore, validation. Yeah, that's now the new setup, improved finance environment. 
improved uh, financial cue learning agent. And now let's get started. So here, this will be the full set of features. Currently, you can add more if you like. Uh, here, symbol, R, return, S for simple moving average, M for momentum, V for volatility, right? And the data is now sliced as follows. I take the first 2,000 data points. You might recall we have roughly 2,500 in the data set. The first 2,000 are used for the learning environment. And the final, not really the final five, but the next 500 are used for the validation. Then we might have uh, very few um, left in this context. So what do we pass in here right now? So symbol, of course, we need to define what is the symbol that we want to work with. What are the features? I have to find them up here. The window is 10, the likes are six. Leverage, I stick to one. Minimum performance level, 85%. So whenever uh, the performance drops below 85%, then the whole thing stops, right? This is then considered a uh, stop, a break, a loss for the agent. Starting point is A. Endpoint is A plus B, so start is uh, zero, end is 2000. Mu is none, standard deviation is none because I don't have any statistics to do the calculation, right? And I see now in the info overview of the data frame, I have my five features, right? Um, that I can use, that I can make use of, and exactly 2000 points in there. So it starts a little bit later. So it uh, when we do the window and the lagging here, right? So it takes care of the, the lags and the window, etc., uh, where we lose a couple of days and then make sure that we have 2000 data points. So the validation environment is now set up in line with the learning environment, right? So um, Simple features from before. And here now, the next ones, learn and learn lag, learn and right? We see that we take now um, the values that we have assumed for the learning environment, so that we are here in line. The start date is now A plus B, which is 2000, and is A plus B plus C, which is now uh, 2500, given the values that we have assumed. And I use now for the normalization mu and standard deviation that I have available from the learning environment. And I get, again, my 500 um, data points here in this uh, context. Yeah, so we have it now all together. In order to get started with our FQL agent, I set the seeds. Uh, here I go with 48 hidden units for my fixed structure sequential model, a pretty small learning rate, um, the learning environment, validation environment, and I go with dropout which would be the default anyways, but I have it uh, explicit here in this, um, in this context, right? So let's get started. This takes a bit. So many questions today, feel free to post them, best on the Discord server, right? So what is reported here? So um, the first value is the total reward. So whether the agent is able to trade through the whole data set or not. So here it was able. Then I get after yeah, every 20th step, I get the validation results. So here it was able to trade through it um, at a performance 0 0.918. Epsilon is still on a relatively high level. Um, so in this context, um, the whole procedure is driven by lots of randomness still. Again, here, total reward, whenever we see uh, 1994, that's basically a um, uh, perfect run, not perfect in terms of performance, but it's a, it's a run where I never, or the agent, never got below 85% performance, because this is the, the uh, major uh, break point here, and you see it here every once in a while. Right, we get like 0 0.84 or something, and then it simply stops. Also here, like that on the last one, it is like um, actually a bad one, but the maximum was 1994, 75.799. Um, so this took a minute, and the epsilon now is still at 30%. So not too many iterations 
So still a 30% exploration. Let's see how the numbers have evolved. You see there was a steep increase of the average here. This is the reward one, you know, this is not comparable with what we had before, but then it deteriorates. And here are the performance measures now, right? So this looks kind of erratic and you see the uh, lower level here, this is the threshold at the 85% level. And whenever it hits 85%, it simply breaks. And this is the last value that is reported. But in between, you see here, this is what we are interested in, right? An agent that makes the right calls, the, the proper predictions. And there was one run where the agent, uh, fortunately it was not at the end, but rather at the beginning, it looks more like a lucky run. But the agent was able to generate uh, yeah, a cross performance uh, based on its trading of uh, above 160 percent here in this context but you see this is very erratic uh, not that much strength of course what we can do is we can go and um, uh, train it again and by again i mean this is a warm start um, so when i simply call the learn method again it will start where it ended before i go now another 60 episodes here for the training so the epsilon value is now further decreased. So we take out randomness and we rely more and more on what was learned before. And I didn't comment on that. Um, here I was, when I was commenting on that, I let it run in the background, of course. Uh, you see here that the, um, the uh, performance on, of the, on the validation data set, this is not really good, right? So this is, uh, the validation is uh, green here. And uh, that's actually pretty, uh, pretty bad. Um, it deteriorates. Yeah, right. It's not like on the break level, but uh, it's also nothing that we would be amazed of. And I'm also not here yet at the point where I say, well, this agent uh, has been trained and applied this agent. I just want to introduce here new additional methods, but by making it more sophisticated, like adding new features, etc., it doesn't give you a guarantee that performance is better in a particular out of sample. Before, we didn't even yeah, care about the out of sample performance, right? Um, we, um, we just had the one data set, and we tested it on the data set. So um, this wasn't even a matter, uh, matter that we um, really took into account there, right? So, but again, this didn't work out too well. And here you see towards the end, uh, something seems to go wrong here with the training. Um, it doesn't get um, the head around it. So we can, of course, uh, change a few things. And I think my results before had been better when I had uh, more emphasis on the here. So with my 255 approach, maybe this might already, maybe <laughs> me on the fly putting this to 100 uh, was worsening the whole uh, story, right? Um, but there are so many factors now with regard to the minimum performance, with regard, uh, for example, also here, I don't know, you can play around with the hidden units, you can uh, change learning uh, rate, learning environment, validation environment. Now, in this context, we have like, in terms of hyperparameters, we have uh, a great, great space, right? The hyperparameter space that is spanned by our uh, parameters so that it's not kind of like an, an easy exercise anymore, just like, I don't know, three parameters and, and figure out kind of like good um, constellations or whatnot. Um, that's uh, now a, a larger uh, problem because it's such a large space in this, uh, in this context. And the training here, although it's now on my M1 Mac and not on Colab or some other infrastructure, is not the fastest at all, right? Maybe. Uh, we would need some some other mechanism to speed this up a bit. But I have a version with the MIP regressor, which um, evaluates uh, the whole thing much, much faster. And it's uh, much faster to train uh, as compared to what we see here with TensorFlow um, Keros. Yeah, there is a, also a good point. Um, I think I have, so I open it. I think I have uh, taken it out, the price feature, uh, which might sometimes even worsen the, um, the um, 
yeah, here you see in the next notebook, I've taken out the price feature. Good point, right? So there's no need why I, or no rule or need or requirement that I in, take into account here the price and the features. Maybe without the price, uh, the predictive power um, is better. We have seen this already when we uh, discussed the more simple setup and we saw that the performance of the simple DQL agent was better basically much better when we focused on the log returns only instead of uh, the price features only, right? This is what we, um, what we have seen. And um, I take the uh, suggestion and let it run there as well. Yeah, the price is not uh, stationary, um, although you're yes dollar with the normalization, we're getting it a bit closer to stationary, but I didn't, uh, I didn't check for stationarity. Uh, that's, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, this looks uh, similar, but not uh, that much better. I let it run now once um, again without uh, the price feature, as I have um, done and said in the um, in the other one. But while this is running and training, so we can compare also the results, um, I want to show you now, um, and this is now a little bit quicker because most of the things are now exactly the same. Um, but this one is now with based on the MLP regressor. Um, lean this up, MFP regressor. The end is still quite some code. Uh, the finance environment is the same, right? So here I also go with the 252 um, that I had before. Um, yeah, everything that we have discussed, it's just now the FQL agent which is based on something else. Also here I have RSMB plus price, if I like, we just discussed this. And uh, here you see it again in action. I instantiate it, pick a symbol, then the features here, I might leave it uh, with uh, the price, right? Um, but later on, maybe I take it out. And you see here again, a positive uh, reward much higher than one, but we have seen it's also easy that we get a negative reward. So now the agent here, you see, it's just like one line of import. You might recall from uh, TensorFlow Keras, we need a bunch of lines to import all the elements and to make sure that um, the, the hashes, uh, the, the, the Python hash seed is set, uh, the eager execution is disabled and all these things. Here it's fortunately a simple um, import. And the rest up here is the same, but the major difference now is here with the MLP regressor. So I am allowing here now also to, um, to specify hidden layers times hidden units, solver atom, also something that I could change in, in the Kira's world, going with atom instead of RMS prop. Um, learning rate should I keep, be kept constant. I go here with a, a random state that is fixed, maximum number of iteration and warm start true. Here it's just one fitting step to get the neural network initialized so that, where do I have it? Down here I can do the partial fit over and over. And I said it, uh, the MLP regressor expects the input in a kind of a different shape. Um, so I go here with uh, flatten and the reshaping, you will see this a couple of times, flatten, reshape, flatten, reshape. So here in multiple lines, right? I, so in other words, I'm not changing the environment to give me another output. I'll leave the environment as it was before uh, and I on the fly change the shape here of the, um, of the state, right? Because it's two dimensional and here I would need something that is also two-dimensional, but flattened out for the MLP regressor to work. But that's, if you like, I've just exchanged the core or the brain, if you like, right? Um, the approximation for the optimal policy in Q-learning, this is what I have uh, replaced here, what I've substituted. Taking out KRS TensorFlow, putting in MLP regressor with some adjustments needed given different um, rules with regard to the data set. But the rest, as they say, then is basically um, the same, right? Also here you see state flat and reshape all due to the effects that we had 
before. And what I mentioned, and uh, I uh, thank you for the comment here, um, taking out or have left out um, the um, have left out the symbol um, itself. So due to stationarity and any other issues that we might run into. Yeah, there's a question with regard to what the model can learn. Um, and then uh, there are a couple of things mentioned. Uh, the impact on profit um, in terms of like um, yeah, execution costs, exchange fees, funding costs, nothing like this is included here. So no transaction costs, uh, nothing else, no slippage or whatever. This is a simple setup where we quote unquote, assume a perfect market, so no transaction costs, we know the price exactly, the execution price is exactly how we see it in the data set, etc. Um, so what we see here is not capable of uh, doing what the question is about, right? To, um, um, for example, a typical question would be, when I have a, a DQL agent and I include transaction costs, what is the impact of uh, too many trades as compared to a somewhat optimal, more optimal, uh, there's no more optimal, to an to optimal number of trades given the transaction costs compared to the profit um, potential that I have there, right? But this is not included here, uh, not yet. Um, this is, of course, not the biggest deal to include transaction costs here as well and to at least uh, judge the impact of uh, frequent trading on the performance itself. So. Uh, net performance as compared to some cross-performance uh, numbers. Right? So the uh, instantiation of the two environments here, as before, data set is the same here. I go now with two times 24. Um, I could also go with 48 and I have a larger number. Maybe I simply go with the same number as before, 61. Um, learning rate the same and let it go. So while this is doing its job now, let's see what has happened here. Um, and indeed, taking out the symbol makes the whole thing um, quite a bit more stable up here, stable in the sense of uh, it doesn't deteriorate afterwards, right? We have seen like this curve going down. I can also let it run another 60 times, right? because there's still lots of randomness included. I think the machine could, could do the trick now to have the two uh, running here. I hope so, at least. And uh, maybe I was a little bit too optimistic because this was slowing down now. Um, but we see the, there the average is already on a level 1884, the performance on 1.1, the validation performance is also quite a bit better um, in this context with that model. And still Epsilon is on the 0.54 level. And you see after 60 training steps, uh, the MLP regressor here um, is doing already quite a bit better. Right, so it's close to 2000, and 2000 would be optimal. Right, we have 2000 values, or 1994, we need to subtract six lakhs afterwards. Uh, 1994 would be optimal as an average, and it has reached that level already kind of, um, kind of early. Also, here the validation performance of the MLP regressor is much, much better. So, frankly, don't ask me what exactly is causing that uh, because. The majority, at least the majority of the parameters, I would need to check one on one if really everything is the same, um, looks similar. But here it seems so A learn faster and has kind of in between kind of like pretty good uh, results already. And the final one that we see here is 180% cross performance, and all the validation performances are here above 100%. So are cross, not all, but most of them are above 100 percent so much much better than what we have seen before here ah, this is now the deterioration that we have seen before right and um ah, here it's still jumping around quite a bit it's now a total of 120 episodes and between it has reached also 
um, sometimes like something uh, 180, 190 percent maybe, right? And indeed, the validation performance it took a while, right? Before here, 60, 70, 80, even 100, still below 100 percent, and then here for the first time towards the end, it's getting better. So a bit more training might do the trick, and maybe we let it run for a third time so that we have a total of 100. Maybe there is now not that much um, exploration anymore because we have reached the minimum level of uh, 10%, right? But this indeed um, looks from the outset much better. So it learns here uh, much faster to trick this particular neural network. And uh, since we have um, had the uh, warm start activated, we can rerun it here as well. But you see here, the final run was uh, 179%, so plus 79%. The average was yeah, pretty close to the 994, which is the maximum, right? And the, the validation performance was also like plus 5.5%. Uh, and throughout it was above, uh, or was positive in terms of net profit, right? But still, you might recall that I've been pointing out that um, we have a major, yeah, we can say major problems here with this approach, right? Um, the major problem being that um, what the agent is doing doesn't have any impact on the environment. Uh, with carpool, with the games contacts, it's immediate, right? You take an action and the environment changes giving the inaction. Here, we move through the environment through the one data set step by step right bar by bar as you would say in finance and it's always the same so there is no influence no feedback of the agent doing action one action zero so predicting up or down going long or short in terms of what is happening in the market so applications or reinforcement learning with regard for example to um, other algorithms not here like predictive algorithms, but algorithms that might um, optimize the execution of block trades or hatching strategies, for example, they might take into account that the trading of large blocks of shares, a large number of shares, has a direct impact on the price in the market. And if you have a proper model um, that gives you the right feedback of a trade on the price, for example, then such an agent is can be trained on an environment which is much closer to a gaming environment than what we do have here, right? Because there is, again, there is no feedback, right? It's just like a static data set and we train it, but we move forward. So we, I would show a different implementation there, uh, which make this more realistic. We see here with the MLP now, uh, the in-sample performance now is, uh, is getting better and better on average, but now the out of sample performance is getting worse. So we see here this typical overfitting uh, topic where uh, training on the training data set, the agent is getting better on the validation data set. On average, it's getting uh, worse in this context. Right? And uh, here, oh, huh? this now looks kind of like a nice thing. Um, the, um, the Keras deep neural network, now after a total of Three runs are 60, so some 180, um, 180 um, uh, runs. Now it's doing indeed better than the MLP. So it took a while. <laughs> Here you see uh, it got worse, better, got worse again. And towards the end, now finally it uh, learned the trick. And here it's uh, yeah, close to perfection, we can say. So over a bunch of um, episodes, it um, like with our carpool game here, an optimal result is obtained. And finally here, also with the validation data set, right? We get now to a relatively stable level of uh, plus, what was it, 8.9% when I recall the numbers correctly. So yeah, you see here, the validation performance is also um, stabilizing on that level. So it finally, got a trick so it was like here a long 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 period where there was nothing like uh, spectacular to say the least uh, then we see here the um the outliers with regard to the average uh with regard to the performance right it's individual performance 
And lastly here, um, it got the validation uh, correct. But also not, you see here, it's uh, still kind of a highly uh, variable thing, but at least it can trade through now the whole data set. And again, it's just for one data set. It's not that we have here a selection of, I don't know, 5,000 um, stocks actually. And uh, no matter what stock the Asian is faced with, it can now do the trick um, because it's just this one data set. And as I said before, this is like solving a puzzle. Once you have solved one puzzle, then the second time you would expect this to be much more uh, easy in this context, right? Um, but uh, yeah, it's a starting point, and I think uh, we're getting more and more realistic. We're adding features, we make the financial Q learning agent a little bit better, and as we go, we will add additional twists. So uh, there will be uh, topics where we add a Monte Carlo simulation so that the agent has, I don't know, uh, 10,000 different time series uh, to, to be trained on, uh, where we are going to add noise to the mix, uh, saying that we have a fixed data set, but now we train it on noise so that we are, that the agent might be better able to differentiate signal from noise, right? This is what we want to do. And then, then right, there are more um, things that we can do to make the whole story more realistic. And yeah, this is what we're going to do in the uh, next uh, webinars. <coughs> There is uh, indeed there's uh, some overfitting going on, and uh, I'm not going too deep here on the um, overfitting side yet because it's anyway it's just one data set, right? Um, and uh, it's a little bit easier to work with um, dropout and, and regularization and, and some other methods to avoid overfitting um, in the context of Keras uh, as compared to MLP. With MLP, we have less flexibility. Um, but uh, we might be able to train it quite a bit faster. With Keras, we have basically all the flexibility that we would like to have, uh, but it takes a little bit longer uh, until we um, have trained the whole thing as we would like to uh, have it perform. Yeah, in that sense, thanks for all the good, all the good comments and suggestions for the discussions. Some of them have been on the fly included, others, might be addressed later on. I will also push to the um, Git repo now the latest versions as usual. And I hope to see you in the next webinar when we add to the story here and try to get our FQL agent doing uh, more tricks, maybe with different data, as I mentioned before, uh, where we uh, yeah, uh, try to simply make it more realistic. That's kind of like the story that we now have. We have the basis and we want to get more and more realistic in this context. In that sense, I wish you happy reinforcement learning. Remember, if you haven't done so, to uh, register here for the Discord server, right, and to join the discussions there, to join on Twitter, and uh, yeah, wish you all the best. See you in the next session. Take care. Bye-bye.